the major thing to say about open shift enterprise in the first place is that it's platform as a service and it runs on top of infrastructure. And this is a key thing. We've got another product called OpenStack. And OpenStack, does anyone know what OpenStack is? Yeah. OpenStack is fantastic. It's next generation cloud infrastructure as a service. And that's all about provisioning the actual environments, provisioning machines, doing the kind of elastic computer, elastic networking you need for the next generation plan. OpenShift doesn't do that. OpenShift runs anywhere you can run RHEL. And that's a, very, that's, that's a very important point. I run OpenShift Enterprise 2.0 on my machine. This is Fedora 17. I run two VMs. And it runs an absolute dream. The whole concept of how OpenShift works is within RHEL. Now it's going to change slightly, because uh, you guys are aware that RHEL 7's going to be coming. Soon. You know, so I, I cross my finger there because we, we don't have a release date for it. I've jumped ahead already. Functional OpenShift is Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Still on top of instances of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Now, the key thing about this, there are two, basically, there are two components that make up OpenShift. We have concepts of brokers and we have concepts of nodes. You have multiple nodes to brokers. The broker is a single point. You actually interact with the system to generate the applications. So that's the meta controls of the system itself. It's how you create the applications, deploy the applications, delete the applications, change the applications at the application level. We call applications gears. And I'll explain what a gear is in a minute. A node is, is like micro virtualization. It's where we actually run the gears. It's where they're actually physically hosted. A node is an instance of RHEL. Yeah, thank you, Matt. We run applications in containers called gears. And this is where it gets sweet. How it actually works is we slice the operating system into sandboxed, concreted containers. This is very important. There are two technologies to use. I'm jumping ahead, so you'll see this in a second. Anyone know what SC Linux is? Yeah. yeah. SC Linux is something called Security Enhanced Linux. It was written by NSA and GTHQ. Um, what they've done is they've introduced mandatory access controls on all aspects of, of Linux itself. Lots of people hate it, because if you turn it on and, and it's, it is incredibly restrictive, certain legacy products work. I like this, pre-configured NSA grade security. What it does is it uses SE Linux and C groups. So we compartment individual slices of the operating system. SE Linux controls the mandatory access controls. It means that the actual user that runs in those gears has no access to anything other than the gear itself. C groups allows the control of process space. And that's very important. Is that a new? No. This is, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. That phrase is, which I like, dehydrated, this new concept. Is that um, when I, I used it at the Red Hat uh, conference last year, yeah. uh, it was like a quick introduction. And the, the first thing I did was try and cut the password file, and I could. Yeah. And I was like, actually I'd rather you just you know, change route me. I think that was probably down to the SNX policy and not the, the actual use of SNX. They've they they used SNX and C groups since day one on this. What's interesting is it's going to change very, very soon. Because the advent of Docker, yeah, Docker and LXC. So we're going to have the Linux container Docker. But in the short term, it's still SNX and C groups. It is a lot tighter than it used to be. Um, I'm going to step off and, and, and say something random about it. The gears themselves are Linux users. And I know, I, I, the reason I can say to you guys, I don't say this to the people I normally talk to, is you talk to normal people and they go, what are the people? Um, what it does, it creates a Linux user. It assigns the ability to actually access various process space, network space, uh, machine space using that user itself. Any interactions you have with the gear, you use an SSH stream which actually contains the user on the stream. Uh, so that's very, very sweet. This concept of dehydrating and rehydrating, now this is nice. The definition of an application running under OpenShift is actually defined by three things. It's defined by the gear size, you know, how big a gear do I want to run in it. It's defined by the cartridge specification, and I'll talk about cartridges in a minute. And it's defined by the actual code itself. Now what's nice about that is that as long as you keep or store the size of the gear you're running and the cartridge specification it needs, which are trivial, and I've just stored the longer database on the broker itself, it's very easy to what we call dehydrate the gears. And that involves just storing the repo and the specification for how you build that gear. Now, OpenShift is currently clever enough to look at the usage of this and dehydrate on demand. So what that means is if you've got a box and you've got 100 gears available on that box, you can overcommit. So we're talking about being able to run 200 gears on a 100 gear box. 
I don't think she was clever enough to idle and de-idle or use them, rehydrate and dehydrate. Those gears to the point where it can, it can actually do over these kind of things. Now, one of the things I love about this is the configuration options on OpenShift are so great. There's almost an unlimited way, an unlimited number of ways you can actually put this thing together. And that's very, very sweet. I'll say I'll park through these because uh, this is all background. So, so even when you do the dehydration, yeah. local file storage, is that on some shared storage else, elsewhere? In the it can be. It can be. I mean, the short term is actually stored on the node itself right now because all you actually physically store. The definition of the gears, in terms of the size and the, uh, the culture specification, yeah. stored on the model database on the broken. The actual repo itself is local to the node. Yeah. So, effectively, it's a stored application. You just need to store the gear. Because you can do that, because you've got this cost of having uh, the dehydrated gears themselves, it's very easy to migrate these gears to another node. And then, when we talk about brokers, we talk about nodes. This is a very, very, uh, very important message. Every single node that runs under a broker has to have the same cartridge specification. Now, the cartridges are basically the partial stacks you offer the developers. When a developer files up an application, you choose which, which primary cartridge he wants to use. He adds additional cartridges for additional functionality. Now we've made it so the brokers themselves, every single node they talk to has to have the same cartridge specification. Now, I was talking to a company about this and they said, well, you know, we want to run up an instance of OpenShift that has 100 cartridges available to the users. And that's a huge install. Well, that, that's a reasonably big install for, for practically to separate the nodes themselves. Now, what we suggest is we're going to do that. You actually separate the system out into brokers with specific cartridge sets that appeal to certain developers. So you have thin cartridges, you don't have fat cartridges. And one of the things we've done to actually do this, and I, I promise not to do any sales thing today, if I start to do sales things, please. Um, but what we do is we have an incredibly cheap skew for buying brokers. Um, so it's 70 pounds a year, and it gives you access to, to, uh, to actually install 20 brokers. So we suggest if you're going to install this and use this, you actually install brokers that are specific to the actual cartridges that are needed for development. So you build ownership instances that are specific to development groups, rather than having fact nodes that have every single cartridge. That's how I jump ahead slightly. Yeah. I will talk about cartridges before I, before I talk about anything else. A cartridge is basically a partial stack. Now, what's lovely about the cartridge is that the cartridge is actually defined by an open standard, which is shared by OpenShift Online. Now, we support some, a, certain, a certain number of cartridges out of the box with OpenShift Enterprise. The cartridges we support employ technologies that are supported 100% in red. And that's the key thing with the, the actual cartridges. So we support 9 or 10 cartridges, which is, is not a huge amount compared to the actual cartridges that are currently available. The reason we can support those is we support it all the way through the operating system. So we support Postgres because we support Postgres 8. We also support Postgres 9. People know what software collections are on RAM? Software collections the ability to actually install multiple versions or later versions of the same software. So you have Postgres 9 running in Postgres uh, 8. Uses an alternative thing to basically the job. But the point with this is that we've used the same open standard for cartridge definition as OpenShift Online. And OpenShift Online has no restriction on the ability to create these cartridges. If it will run on rail, you can squeeze it into a cartridge. And every man and his dog currently in the outside world is writing OpenShift Online cartridges. If you use OpenShift Enterprise, which is our supported version of this, you can install the cartridges for OpenShift Online. And we will support the installation of the cartridges. We won't support the usage or configuration of those cartridges, but we will support and help with the installation of those cartridges. Now, that's the Red Hat standard way of talking about this. When I talk, about, talk to my customers, they have some very, very clear requirements on the cartridges. They, they, don't, they don't want to offer JBoss and Tomcat as a cartridge. They want to offer Tomcat with extended security, with you know, record level management. With record level auditing, all these additional features that you don't normally get out of the box with things like time count generals. The cartridge specification is extensible, so you guys can actually write your own cartridges. And the way Red Hat has sold it is that you, you set up partial stacks in the cartridges. We've got things like MySQL, MongoDB, Perl, PHP, Python, every man is dog in terms of languages. Now, the way I've been pushing it is that if you've got a data source or a set of services that are specific to your business, they're things that you've got, they're your IPR, they're very important to you. What you can do is you can wrap those in a cartridge and then offer that cartridge for third-party developers or your own developers to develop it. The good thing with that is 
You're controlling the API. You're doing a service level abstraction that you've been trying to get to for the last 10 years. And the lovely thing about it is that you can then change your implementation. If you've got a data source that's based around, let's say, MongoDB, and you decide, decide that MongoDB is, is not good enough, you want to use Cassandra. No idea why. You can change that with no impact on the code that's been developed against it from a cartridge perspective. As long as the cartridge itself retains the API. So you get the ability to actually do service level abstraction from a perspective of offering services to third party developers. One of the SOs I'm currently talking to, they see the commercial spin on this, which is that they have a very important transactional database that they, they offer to their users. And this is very secure database, um, very important, high throughput, all those kind of things. And they wanted to allow a kid in his bedroom to write a mobile application over the top of it. Now, there's no way on earth you want to give a kid in a bedroom direct access to your critical transaction system. It's insane. Absolutely insane. So what they're going to do is they're going to stand up OpenShift instances. They've written a cartridge that actually wraps the API, or wraps the services offered by the transaction system. And the kid can just log onto the OpenShift system, select the cartridge which gives him access to the financial transactions, and he can go and write his mobile application. And what they've done is retained the control over the data. They've also created a single point of input to the data. So they've got all stability, they've got record level management, they've got all the security things you need from that perspective. But that's not something Red Hat talks about. Red Hat talks about just pushing cartridge bit by center. Me, I see this as being able to produce a persistent, consistent development environment and also make it easier for developers. I'll say that later in terms of the way we actually migrate from instance to instance. I come from a background of serious testing. You know, I, I worked in the, the European Space Agency where you know you couldn't make a mistake because it was like 20 million pounds worth of satellite before I had to scan. So they have a huge testing regime already. They have like a, a week of development would equate to three months of testing. Now I think in the agile way, or the way we currently have, we've moved away from that. Are there, how many people here work in an agile methodology? Is it a real agile methodology? <laughs> like a real agile methodology. <laughs> right. There are two types of projects. There are agile projects and there are projects that should never, never ever be agile under any circumstances. Agile gives you the ability to actually change. That's the whole point of it. If you've got a project, you've got a piece of software you have to write, and you don't know how to write it, what you're going to produce, what it's going to do, agile is absolutely fantastic. If you've got a project where you're migrating an existing system, you know exactly what it's going to do, you know exactly the non functional requirements, it should never be agile. What's the point? You're not gaining anything by actually making that agile because you know the end product, you know what you're trying to produce. I say, I've worked on a number of projects where they just try to push agile on there. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're on side, aren't you? Um, what I love about OpenShift Enterprise 2.0 is it's been specifically tailored to cater for agile projects. When we talk about agile projects, we talk about multiple developers actually working on the same piece of code or the same sort of the same project. OpenShift automates gear, configuration via cartridges, again, I've talked about this. Um, let me jump on. We should have a very small amount of cartridges, again, because we have to actually physically support them. There's two, what we call premium cartridges, which, which I hate the terminology. And that's EWS and EAP. EWS is a supported version of Tomcat. So we ship a version of cartridge that actually supports Tomcat 6 and Tomcat 7. The beautiful thing about it is it's supported. Now, there's a phrase I like to use here when I'm talking to the customers about this. And it's the half past three in the morning stack trace. Now, there's got to be people in the room that have suffered from the half past three in the morning stack trace. If you choose to develop your entire system case open source software, community software, then you own that. Even if the problem is not in your code itself, there's a stack trace I have a in the morning, they're going to be defending you. But the lovely thing about using, let's say, supported open mm -hmm. source is that it becomes Red Hat's problem for the half past three in the morning stack trace. I'd say we ship two premium cartridges, one's EAP6 and the other is EWS6, uh, EWS7. We also produce PHP, Python, Ruby, uh, MySQL, Postgres. We've just put MongoDB into software collections. So we're going to be producing a MongoDB project for those people that are use. How it works. I think the majority of people in here have a play with it. 
I know I asked earlier. There are two distinct event models within the OpenShift system. The first one is based upon the applications itself. So when you talk to the actual broker, when you create an application, when you deploy an application, when you shut it down, when you change its URL, when you change its domain, that's all messages that are sent to the broker. That's an event model I called the meta event model. The actual code and deployment model is based upon pushing code into a Git repo. Now you guys are aware of what Git repos are. Always ask if someone in the back always goes, are you subversion? Which I doubt probably tell you to do subversion. Um, the whole event model within the actual nodes themselves is based around the Git repos. So when you actually create an application, you're given a single repo. That repo contains all the configuration files for the cartridge you've chosen. You can then code and push against that. When you push against it, the code is built and deployed within the gear. So everything is based around a single point event model, which is actually pushing into the, that repository. At OpenShift 1.0, 1.1, that repository was private. So a user would create an application, he'd be given access to that repo, he would be able to communicate with it, develop it, deploy all those kind of things. One of the things PayPal asked us for was the ability to put a group level control mechanism over the repos. So now we've got the ability for a group of people to actually access the repos. We've also got administration rights, which has got a view by score. I'll cover that when I get to the what's, what's new in 2020. Any major than Jenkins fans in the room? Seriously? <laughs> I hate Bacon with a passion. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I hate Bacon with a passion, again, a slight aside. Um, I had to use Bacon when it first came out to build Jetty, uh, and it was an absolute. Absolutely. I know it's got a lot better, um, but I'm a bit of an We've got a Jenkins cartridge, so you can actually install a Jenkins cartridge with your application and use that to do continuous integration. So when you actually deploy the code itself, rather than being built and pushed straight into the gear itself, it goes into Jenkins. It does, it does the build, runs the test, does all those kind of things. What's nice about it is with the Jenkins cartridge running in the gear itself, if the build fails, it doesn't overwrite the existing application. So if you write a piece of code, you push it into Jenkins, and it's, it's wrong, or the tests fail, for example, it doesn't bring down the application. The application will continue to run the previous version, which is nice. We serve HTTPS from Gears, so you can lock down access to Gears through HTTPS. Nice and new. This is the cool bit. In the old days, when I was trying to sell this, or trying to push this to the SIs themselves, the issue was this. When you get to a situation where you want to actually put it into production, Where's the need for an open shift? A lot of people I talk to, they have the ability to actually stand up their own stacks, to build a machine from scratch on top of the team, to put the edge of our service bus, to put the databases in place, and actually to put the code. In the old days, it was kind of, well, if you wanted to run it on open shift at the end of the day, you could take your open shift code, which you developed to find the Git repo, and you could push it to a production node, and this node would have a definition for the size of gear that took up the entire machine. So you'd have the ability to run a single gear on the node. Now, that to me was a bit mad, because I thought, you know, what, what's the point of having the overhead installing the infrastructure from an ownership perspective? But a lot of people I talked to, and a lot of SIs in particular, liked that, because it was very, very easy to stand up the cartridges. It's much easier to install, for example, the JWAS cartridge, the Tomcat cartridge, than it is to start from bare metal. Now, what we've done with the latest version, which is where it gets very nice, We've got this concept, a concept called binary deployment. And what binary deployment is, is you can actually override the build process of the gears themselves. So rather than forcing a rebuild of the source code every time you push it, you can actually say, I just want to take a war, I want to take it here, I want to take a wrong, and push that bottom across. So rather than going through the process of actually building the stack and building the actual application itself, it will push the binary deployment across. This came from a perspective of PayPal. And what PayPal was saying was, from a development perspective, they want to rebuild everything. Because your developers are developing code, you want to know when you push it into a gear that all the cartridges are clean. From scratch, you want to know the code builds. That's an essential from a development perspective. When you get to test and QA, that's not so much. You're not interested in whether or not the stack builds, because the stack is standard. So you do it as a binary deployment. When you get into production, and this, this is something they've left off of all the slides, you do not want every gear you build it. If you're starting a production system that's got, let's say, two or three thousand applications, you do not want those applications to rebuild the machine. It will take forever to actually come back. Because every 
every single gear has to reload every single cartridge, and then we can So what we've got is this concept called binary deployments, where you can actually move it, and you can specify as part of the build process, rather than building the code from scratch, you can say it's a binary object, by regenerating from the code, and push that across. And that's a huge thing for the Because it means you can redeploy very rapidly, and you can move things to production systems. something they added, uh, which is, is, is pretty clever, but, but I don't quite see the use for it. We've got the concept of being able to add an agent proxy. And what that does is it basically looks at the, the, the web traffic that's going into your application, and it can, on demand, or on threshold, actually spin off additional units. Now that's pure production. You know, you, you, from a development perspective, I'm not, not sure where the agent proxy concept comes in. What's nice about it, this is why I haven't mentioned, if we have a cartridge that does persistence, so let's say we have a cartridge like Tomcat and a cartridge like Neo Utilizer, Post Services, Post Dive, Java, all those kinds of things. When you add an additional cartridge which has persistence in it, you don't want to have to copy that every time you spool it on or scale it up. It just makes for a huge inefficiency if you try to HA and all those kinds of things. So the model they've got for it is when you actually add an additional cartridge that does persistence, it gets created in a separate gear. The nice thing about it is all the interactions with separate gears are actually done to environment factors. So it enforces dependency injection. You, know, you write your code specifically around the environment variables itself, which means you can change the inputs, the outputs, you can push things in, etc. From a scaling perspective, it means that what happens, we create a gear that has the persistence. When we have to scale to multiple gears running the application, they are given the environment variables to a single gear. So, this application here running on JBoss, if it exceeds the threshold we've specified for the HA proxy, it'll file with another gear that contains JBoss and copy the code across the current state, so any configuration or any current session to actually return. It will then use HA proxy to do um, load balancing across the gears it's created, but the persistence is done for the single point. And that's reasonably clever. Okay, it's not that good from an HA perspective, but we have the ability to actually do high um, availability by doing out to back to it. I was the one question I had to cover. The scale of your system here, your persistence here. Well, I know you can adjust the environment variables you could do yourself and kind of switch back. Yeah. And whereas in a clever way to do it, you don't want to. No. PayPal said it. PayPal said that method's a bit sharp. So, what PayPal wanted was the ability to actually put uh, hardware load on the so what happens now is the broker actually interacts from a DNS perspective with the load balancer. And you can stand up multiple active active nodes and then the hardware load balancer which does that. Yeah. So this handles proper production by yeah. Structure itself, I've talked about this. Open chip functions are, are upstream. You can go and get open chip function right now, it's totally free. It's very fragile uh, because it's designed to be fragile, it's designed to actually stress the next generation this kind of stuff. OpenShift Online, if you go to openshift.redhat.com, you can go and play with it right now. OpenShift Enterprise is our actual one. Again, an American slide on Optimus. Again, an American slide on Optimus. But do we move to the larger lessons with this PayPal wanted? With PayPal wanted. What I like about this is all the actual, uh, all the actual enhancements we have for 2.0 are critical. They're actually fantastic. They make uh, OpenShift Enterprise fantastic production system as well as a development system. But they all come from the needs of a customer that's bought it and then pushed the need back into the community. It's the way the open source side works. We didn't have an administrator's console. So if you want to do a 1.1, uh, if you want to do any interaction with, you know, what the hell are my nodes doing, what's the load, what kind of overcommitment have I got, how many gears am I running, all that kind of stuff. You have to do some quite nasty command line uh, interactions. They've wrapped it into a very pleasant interface. The only downside is they have this at the moment. This is going to change. Um, so basically, it says you know, the system is broken, it's not working, here's what you have to do to change it. So you can't do an administration change to an administration interface, but that's coming in the next week. This is way better than I think it's actually fantastic. That was essential. Team collaboration was absolutely essential. What this allows you to do now 
is to expose individual gears and individual applications to agile teams. So you don't have to have every man his dog having their own applications, then going through a problem of aggregating that data or that kind of code together. You can actually have teams working on your applications. Again, something that came from one of our customers. Kind of very exciting. There's actually a lot more than that. Um, any no.js fans in there? Because mm -hmm. I love no.js. I think it's absolutely fantastic. But, you know, I was shouted down about 12 years ago when I said JavaScript the next bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> any. It was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> no.js, I think, is absolutely fantastic. It's absolutely brilliant. If you get a chance to look at it, it's brilliant. We know we're on a cartridge and how to play with it. Um, the other things to be aware of, the JBoss stuff is premium cartridges. So there's an additional cost if you buy a chip enterprise. Uh, I think there's deals you can have if you already run JBoss and stuff. We don't ship the entire JBoss stack as cartridges. And this is something that we've, we've been thinking about doing, it's something we think we need to do. For example, I, does anyone here know what JDG is? JDG? Infinispan? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 JDG is our enterprise version of Infinispan. It's absolutely fantastic, multiple scalable, very, very resilient in memory days. I love it because it, you can do some fantastic near real time analysis. We haven't got a JDG cartridge yet, which I think is a, is a shame. It's something we're missing. However, someone in the community has generated an Infinispan cartridge. So you can actually download the Infinispan cartridge from OpenShift Online. And you can store it in OpenShift. I actually use it. Anyone know what heat is? Anyone know? Uh, you guys know what OpenStack is? Basically. OpenStack is our cloud provisioning uh, system. It's broken down to a number of different applications, each of which handles a different type of thing as a service. Computers as a service, networks as a service, all those kinds of things. We have an uh, orchestration tool called Heat, which allows you to, to very quickly kick up and run new versions on OpenStack. One of the things we've done is we've produced templates that allow you to produce OpenShift. So you can start up OpenShift very quickly, you can scale up, you can scale down. It's not hard to install OpenShift, but this makes it much, much easier. Web routine tier enhancements, this is just basically the load balancer we talked about earlier. What's next? We're going to switch to a different form of containers. Um, when RHEL 7 comes out, we're going to look at Docker, we're going to look at LXC. This is because LXC and Docker are, are built on the same technologies that we currently use for the gears themselves. So it's natural thing. Deepum has an IIS integration, OpenStack platforms. Um, this is of interest. I talked about us not having a number of the JBoss uh, applications to cartridge. What they've done is they've decided to look at how people use JBoss. So rather than saying we want to produce a root system, or we want to produce uh, a JDG version, or we want to produce a version specific to bit virtualization, they said, what are the problem cases? What are the use cases people actually use this kind of stuff for? And we've introduced something, I'll jump ahead slightly, called XPass. And what they're doing is rather than actually porting the individual JBoss applications, they're producing problem centric cartridges. The first one's going to be mobile based around Aero Gear. So the only guys with Bang Aero Gear. Yeah. Um, that's going to be basically uh, enterprise level data to mobile devices. We're also going to do Fuse. So we're going to have messaging and Fuse uh, cartridges. And finally, is that, is that all Fuse or use Fuse set as well? It's Fuse ESP. So it's basically Camel, Camel and Fabric. Um, and what's yeah. nice about it is we currently have, there is a community cartridge we need, and that's going to roll into production as part of XPass and some application. Uh, <coughs> so the VPN as a service. I think it's a good approach. I think they've actually started to think about you know, how people will use cartridges as opposed to just pushing out the technologies or pushing out the JBoss um, What we've been doing, what we've been talking about with customers, is the ability to actually incorporate the entire developer life cycle using OpenShift. This is everything from the point of view of the prototypes, the concepts, starting development, right up to hosting your production strength systems. And basically using the OpenShift concept all the way through. There's a number of ways to do this. Now there's OpenShift at the developer end. 
and we're talking about control. This is the event model based on the code push. You create the app, you turn the app, you write the code, you write the action hooks. Action hooks I haven't mentioned yet. Action hooks are basically positions within the life cycle of a year where you can run shell scripts. So, for example, there's a bill, there's deploy. It allows you to, to, to change the way in which the contract is built. Uh, push the application, test the application. I call this micro application. Over to the gear level, this is the gear lifecycle driven by messages. Uh, create, activate the cartridges, code push, you run the cartridge build action hook, you then run the application build action hook. And run the cartridge and deploy the action hook and start the app. So that's all the thing to do with actually running the application within the unit assembly. So those two things. Over to the developer and gear control. Again, the vet model based on the message from the broker. Um, for those people who have used OpenShift, we've got a number of different ways you can actually interact with the broker itself before you even start to do the code. We've got the ability to interact with the web interface, so you can go to the web interface and provide. You can actually create your applications there, you can monitor your applications, you can create your applications there. We've got a fantastic command line tool called RHC. So anything you can do in terms of interacting with the applications themselves, you can do from the command line. And finally, for those people who like IDEs, uh, we've got a fantastic plugin for Eclipse, which you get for free as part of the JBoss Developer Studio, called the OpenShift Browser, which allows you to actually interact directly with the OpenShift. You can create applications, you can push the applications, you can control all the applications. Now, this is used for create, restart, snapshot, and delete. Snapshot is quite interesting. At any point when you deploy an application, you can take a snapshot. But that gives you all the code and the actual configuration of the gear to be able to go back to yourself and make it in service. It's also very good in terms of taking backups. So if you're rolling this to production and you, and you want to have something more than an active active kind of uh, HA uh, approach, you can use that. One thing we've introduced uh, at 2.0 is the ability to do rollback. So you can actually turn on the ability to have a, uh, a rollback of pushes. So you can push, 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 and then roll back to the rollback three. And the binary deployment stuff. I call this macro app of gear controls. I've talked about the definition of gear consisting of a three-level definition. Now, for the three-level definition, this is the gear sizing, it's the cartridge specification, and this is the code itself that makes up that application. Because we've got it split into three levels, this, can this allows you to transition to different instances very, very easily. Now, when you talk about gear sizing, this is one of the things that, that I find quite, quite odd. We have a label for defining the size of gears, and then no one can handle a single size. So you probably know that this handles small gears or medium gears. The definition of those gears is actually controlled by configuration on the node itself. Now, OpenShift allows you to host applications of the same size on any node that supports that size. We also have the concept of what we call a district, and a district is a grouping of the same nodes of the same size. Now, what's nice about this is you can start up another OpenShift instance with the same definition for, in terms of name of the size, yet have different values. So you can fire out a small application on your development system. That could be one gig space, a tiny amount of CPU, all these kind of things. On your test QX system, it could be bigger. On your production system, it could be a whole ship. And you can this allows you to actually transition the applications between things. Um, I say open ship instances can be configured to provide life cycle. This is where the, the slide we saw earlier, the development, test, QA, all those kind of things. The thing I've been talking about a great depth with, with the customers I've been trying to push this to is this ability to put governance between the transitions. So you develop an application on your development system, you want to move it to text. You can put a governance stage on it, you can make it automated, you can make it manual. That governance stage can say, well, this, this, this code is not suitable, this code is not acceptable, this is A lot of people I deal with need that level of governance to move from point to point, they call it stage game, all that kind of stuff. And this allows you to do it. None of the sizes you do with this. Yeah, your custom size is every Yes, as long as you do it. Absolutely. You've got one size per node. Right. Five, so take these, these size. Yeah. And have it just yeah. Yeah. But what happens is if you if you actually install a node and manage a broker, yeah. the broker will pick up automatically that you can handle the size, dates, yeah. that is funky thing. And then any request to build up a build up of type days fucking size will be forwarded to that. Uh, okay. That's the way it works. 
Um, this is an example of actually doing the, the whole life cycle with dev, small notice, resource, functional requirement development. So you use the development itself to actually do the functional requirement development. Small notes, very quick, very fast, started for application. On test, you have small notes, limited resource, no code changes. Binary deployments to make it much more touch deploy them, and functional requirement testing. So that's where you test the functional requirement. Again, you can transition out to that. So if it fails the functional requirement, you can move back into development for the time. QA, for example, indicative size nodes. Now this is very important because one of the things I find that people miss in agile projects is no one ever focuses on non-functional requirements. They're not very easy to express in the store. Now, in this kind of model, what you would do is you would actually have non-functional requirement testing at the QA point because you've got the indicative size nodes. And then finally, production. Production size nodes, operational resource, no code changes, binary deployments, operational requirements. Everything I've said is not fixed in stuff. You can configure open shift enterprise you can't take. This is just a way to actually do that. And that's it. So any questions?